Eugene Peterson's The Message, I believe, is even on there. So you get a lot of, uh, a lot of choices. So I'm hoping that you've had time to now get your Bibles. So let's go ahead and open to Philippians 1. I want to just introduce the panel here today. So um, Wendy Smith is here with us. She was here with us last week when we did this. So welcome, Wendy. It's good to be here. And then to my right is Kyle. Great sermon this morning, Kyle. Thank you. Appreciate the good message. And Steph Borger is here this morning. She is representing uh, adult ed, the teachers in adult ed. And so I believe we're, we may have a rotating, maybe, or we just... Yeah, that's our hope. We're hoping to have some of our regular adult ed teachers here. Ordinarily, we have three different classes that meet. During this strange time, we're all coming together as one. So we will hopefully have a rotating cast of some of our regular Sunday school teachers joining in this conversation. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning. As you can see, we are maintaining the appropriate distance from each other. So. Also, just want to encourage you, if you are going out at all to get groceries or to do some, uh, something that you need to do, um, maintain, maintaining the, uh, the six-foot social distancing rule is uh, really, really important. So we want to keep all of you safe. And um, so with that, let us, let us get into Philippians 1 here. Um, we're, going to just, we're going to take it in three different sections, I believe. First, we're just going to do verses 1 to 9. And just to set this up a little bit, um, Philippians uh, is a letter that was written by Paul to the Philippian community. Um, Philippi was kind of a Roman, col- it was a Roman colony in northern Greece. So um, the Philippians know that Paul is imprisoned at this point. And they get really, really worried about Paul um, because they love Paul so much. And Paul has been a great encouragement for them. Um, And so they uh, needed a word. They needed a word from Paul. And Paul was able to get them a letter even from his prison cell. So this is Paul writing from prison to kind of a minority group. in uh, uh, make, consisting mostly of Gentile Christians at this point. So um, they are a small group, but they're a mighty group. So let's read verses 1 to 9. Um, Wendy, would you like to read, please? Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Jesus Christ at Philippi, Philippi together with the overseers and deacons, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much for that reading, Wendy. So, everybody, what really stands out to you um, from those first, those, those opening verses of this letter? What strikes you about the tone, the, the, the choice of words? Uh, what strikes you? Grace and peace um, to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, 
very um, typical of Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very powerful reading. Um, it's just, um, there's a beautiful song called Grace and Peace by Fernando Ortega that I love. And uh, you just run over these words really quickly and you're thinking, okay, it's just a greeting. But there's a lot in Paul's prayers and a lot in Paul's greetings. To, to understand. I get bowled over right away in verse 3 when Paul says that he is constantly praying with joy in a circumstance that I would find really hard to be joyful in mm -hmm. um, or at least would take a while to come around to that. But that's the first thing that he says like right off the bat. Right. And that's one of the things, oh, go ahead, Wendy, I think you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Doug? Um, I just, I'm with Steph, I thank my God that his prayer would start with thanksgiving. Yeah. And so many of my prayers start with help. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's, I think by starting with thanksgiving, that rehearses what God has always done, what God has done before. And that, that's uh, just a good framework for me to, yeah. to start with thankfulness. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things I thought of while reading this, just these first few verses, is to think about the kind of adversity that Paul faced and his environment writing from a prison cell. To have even so much thanksgiving in the midst of that is really kind of unbelievable. And that, that kind of joy only comes from knowing, knowing God, knowing, knowing God through Christ. So, you know, I'm thinking about where we find ourselves in this kind of, you know, um, kind of sad time. I mean, I, I heard the other day, and I think this is very true, that we're all kind of going through the stages of grief. Um, so, you know, like from denial to like anger, and then, you know, finally to acceptance. But it's this process that we're going through as a nation because our lives look completely different than they did just about a week and a half ago. And they're going to look different. The, our lives are going to look different for a while. This is not something that's just going to all of a sudden go away. Um, so we're just kind of adjusting to a new normal. But even in this time of adversity, is there a way that we can have joy and, and, thanks, and, and thanksgiving? And I think it's not just our nation, it's like it's the whole world. So Yeah. I mean we're we're all in the midst of trying to navigate um, changes in our rituals, which are some are very important, like um, like graduation. Like if you've worked four years to get through high school or college right. or do your master's degree and and you can't don the hat and walk the accolades of all the people you've worked with or studied with for the last four years. I mean, that's right. that's a serious loss. Um, it is such a loss. That, um, right now, um, talking with some folks, we're planning on, you know, having a wedding, mm -hmm. and they're just having to struggle through what's that going to look like. Oh, um, absolutely. I mean, and we, you know, there may be some funerals coming up, and what do you do when you can't gather your whole family together to say goodbye, to properly say goodbye and, and have a service for your loved one? I mean, these are, these are losses. Mm. Um, and, and I think also Paul dealt with the uncertainty, and we're dealing with uncertainty too, of not, not really knowing what next week is going to look like or the week after that, or who knows what kind of course this is all going to take. Um, and so, you know, and Paul didn't know if he was going to see the Philippian community again, a community in which he deeply loved. So there was that uncertainty, too, but yet still he writes this very passionate, very comforting letter to them, even though so many things are uncertain in his life and in the life of this community. And I think we see some of his ability to hold those things in tension, especially articulated in verse 6. Where Paul writes, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. 
that in the short term, maybe even for the rest of his life, there's a lot of uncertainty. But Paul also very clearly has in mind the big picture of God's redemption of the world, that whatever happens, we know that Christ is returning and Christ will make all things new and the work that God has begun in us will not go to waste and will be brought to completion yeah. in that day when God's plan for the salvation of all good, of all things, of all the world, is brought to completion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I feel like this is very similar to, um, you know, in Plenty and in Want, he would write, he would say, you know, I've, whether I'm shipwrecked, whether I'm well-fed or I'm hungry, I've found the secret of contentment. And um, for Paul, in this text here that you just read, is about hope. And, um, and even though he's physically separate from the Philippians, who he loves so much, they're not really separate. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a sense in which somehow there's a fellowship happening yeah. that's real, even though the physical location of right. a prison and a city it's not just the memory of what they did together. It's a, it's a current active relationship that is real. Um, and I think that that's maybe one of the things we can think about in terms of going through the grief process yeah. is um, using our imagination mm-hmm. and um, being creative in the way we do rituals. I mean, perhaps there'll be a virtual graduation or... Um, Perhaps there'll be um, plays that are written, uh, the redemptive plays that are written, or songs that are written, or or create art that's created um, out of this sense that um, hope has got us, you know. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. In the midst of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. you know, not, Mm -hmm. not just like, okay, so this is like going to get better one day and I'm going to be good or I'm going to be complete. But but no, it's a living, present exercise of God's presence. And I think in that, in this, I love the celebration of disciplines by by Foster. He has a whole chapter on imagination. Celebra- I guess he calls it celebration. Yeah, that, celebration, yeah, celebration. D- d- disciplines. Um, yeah. And the godly play is like that. And, you know, really adults can really enter into godly play mm-hmm. too. Um, just like we could if you pull up Fred Rogers on Netflix or Amazon and watch. You can enter into that because there's, there's an exercise of imagination. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I feel like Paul was just... Um, He just felt this connection and knew it was real with the people he was writing to, you know. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And at the same time, though, in verse 8, Paul says, how I long for all of you. And that's such an interesting tension to me, that on the one hand, there's such confidence expressed in our partnership and our sharing in the gospel. And at the same time, there's this real sense of longing of wishing for the ability to be together. And both of those things exist at the same time. Yeah, I, I think there's a freedom in this to be able to say both of those in the same breath. Yeah. I mean, that takes a lot of freedom to say, I'm confident and I long. Yeah, yeah and like okay. you said last week, Wendy, about Romans 8, about that section about prayer, mm-hmm. you said uh, living in the groan. The groaning. Living in the groaning, you know? And that's such a part of our Lenten discipline, isn't it? Yeah. And that groaning. Um, And I want to encourage all of you out there who are watching um, to, to reach out to other people. I mean, Paul reached out to the Philippian community through a letter. Right now, we have other ways to reach out to one another. So that connection for us is still very much alive, even though this is an empty sanctuary right now. There's just the four of us here. Um, But, uh, you know, just checking up on people is really important. And I know our deacons and our Stephen ministers are going to be doing that. Um, Each of them have about eight to ten families, uh, which they're going to check in on. 
but it doesn't hurt for you, you to pick up the phone or, or to shoot out a text or something like that, just to see how, just to see how, um, how your neighbors and friends are doing during this time and the way that Paul reached out to, to his community. He says, since I have you in my heart. Mm. Since I have you in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Whether I'm in change or... You know, if, if you've been to prison and done any prison ministry, you understand how the, the power of um, prayer and imagination and music and creativity literally is like survival. Yeah. Like if, if they can get together in a yeah. church and sing around a piano, it's like literally a portal from heaven before they have to go back to mm-hmm. the, the cell. Mm-hmm. And um, it's powerful, you know, it's very powerful. So I, I guess the question is, in some ways we are imprisoned with, you know, we're supposed to stay home mm-hmm. and we're not supposed to be out and about. So how can we be free at the same time we are, you know, in this not really a prison, but kind of, and yeah. kind of, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Paul says he's imprisoned for the sake of Christ or the sake of the gospel. What does it mean for us to be quarantined for mm-hmm. the sake of Christ? Mm-hmm. Quarantined for the sake of the gospel, mm-hmm. and and keeping to the quarantine for the sake quarantine for yeah. the, for the sake of Christ. In other right, words, exactly. washing our hands and right. keeping our social distances because right. that's the loving thing to do. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think one thing that's so interesting about this letter is we've already seen that Paul talks about our communi- our communion and our unity being expressed in prayer and thanksgiving for one another and holding each other in our hearts. But as we'll see in a few weeks when we get to the end of this letter, Paul's also thanking his community for really practical assistance, um, that they sent him money and supplies while he was in prison. And so what does it mean for our community, our love in this time to be both prayerful and spiritual, but also really practical. Practical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think in our world today, when we are facing a public health crisis like this, staying home as much as we can, mm-hmm. following the guidelines of our health officials is actually a really practical proclamation of the message of the kingdom of God. Right, mm-hmm. right. That when churches all across the country are doing this unheard of thing, saying yeah. we are all actually shutting our doors and frantically right. figuring out how to live stream and doing these unheard of things for lots of our congregations, yes. that this proclaims what it means to actually put the love of our neighbors ahead of anything else. Mm-hmm. Boy, and that, that is so true. And that is hard getting through to kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I am dealing with two boys who want to have play dates <laughs> and who actually want to go back to school and see their friends and see their teacher and get back, get their routine back. And so trying to explain that to them in terms of this is how we love our neighbor has been, you know, I think has been hard for them to grasp, but at the same time, I think they're getting it. Um, you know, because I put it in terms of like, hey, you know, we do this because grandma, grandma and grandpa, you know, I mean, just I try to put it in terms that they can understand. You know, grandma and grandpa, they could get sick and we don't want them to get sick and we don't want anybody else to get sick. And so this is why we are, we are isolating ourselves. But for me, the one thing that has been really helpful and I've been struggling through all those stages of grief because I'm, I'm an out and about person and I like, I just love to just be out going places and visiting places and visiting people. And, um, is just the thing that's helped me is just still getting out in nature. I mean, like you were saying this morning in your sermon about you, like you planted grass seed this week and that was just life giving for you. I mean, and that just... I'm going to plant a garden of green chilies, too. I'm about <laughs> and then you're going to have us all over after this is over. <laughs> after all this is over, yeah. You're going to make salsa for us. <laughs> and you're gonna... But um, I think just finding the things that give you life and that connect you, I think, to God um, are just really essential. And taking care of yourself, that was such a wonderful message this morning, Kyle, about Thanks. taking care of yourself. Wendy is a spiritual director. Give us some advice on taking yeah. care of ourselves. 
Well, this is a wonderful time to be in contemplative prayer. I mean, we have all this space and time and quiet. You know, I took a walk this morning and I could hear the woodpeckers and the birds. And um, I was actually uh, keying in on a, a webinar yesterday. And one of the things they said um, for spiritual directors, and one of the things they said was nature, be out in nature and listen to the birds. And I thought, I need to listen to the birds as much as I need to listen to the news. Yes. And I need to hear what Amen. the birds are saying. That's I need great. to hear what nature is saying. Um, my husband and I saw two hawks flying overhead and we just stopped. So what is it about them. being in nature for you? Why do you think they're saying that? What do you think it is versus just watching the news? What do you think being in nature, well, it's, what's the it's word grounding. that's coming to you? It's grounding. It's grounding. Uh -huh. There's a grounding there. Um, literally last night, I went outside, I took my shoes off, and then I just felt the ground underneath me and looked mm. up at the sky mm. and just stood there, you know, not saying anything, not trying to think anything. It was kind of cold last night. It was cold. My feet were cold. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't but, say long. But, I, but I'm wondering, you know, for me, when you say all that, I feel the same way, and it's a pretty common experience, I think, for a lot of people who like to get out of nature. For me, it's that the world is not revolving around me. Yes, yes. And I felt that in Mumbai in, 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 uh, last summer in India. Wow, there's just, just so many people. The world doesn't revolve around me. When I go to the ocean, wow, I'm so little. Yeah. When I see a mountain, yeah. I mean, there's so much going on that God, in God's world that, that's happening outside our own ego or our own yeah. sense of whatever the, the newest doom is. Yeah. Um, that, that's what it does for me. It makes me feel like I'm a part of it, but it's not revolving around my mm -hmm. own perspective. Well, and it's beyond us. I, you know, I it's looked beyond up us. at the sky and I said, you know, stars, do you know what's going on here? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, I think about that with the animals, the little animals yeah. that I see. I'm yeah. Like, do they even know like what's going on? They don't know what a coronavirus a is. Pandemic, but they're just like happy, you know. <laughs> just, it's true. Yeah. Verses 9 and 10 kind of speak to some of these things for me. Yeah. This is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. And these words like full insight... And I know some um, translations, I think, use the word so you may discern what is best, mm -hmm. um, of really thinking critically and prayerfully, both about how we spend our own time and attention and what's good for our soul, yeah. but also about what's good for our neighbor and what's good for our world, that it is bigger than our own desires. Yeah, so I was talking to my neighbor who was also seeding his grass. And we were yelling, at call, calling at each other. And he's Catholic. Were you six feet he's, apart? He's Catholic. And I didn't know if his church was streaming okay. services or yeah. not. And so I said, you know, you could stream and watch our services. Yeah. He said, you know, I'm going to hit your service first. Then I'm going to hit my service. <laughs> I said, man, I didn't mean to bird dog you away from your, your church. You need to go. To, he said, no, the more the better, you know. <laughs> and just that, that conversation was just yeah. life-giving. Even though we were 30 feet apart from right. each other, right. it, was, it, was, it was connectional. And the, the one thing that I would, I think that about the insight into love, you know, that he talks about there, that you were just talking about, Stephanie, a deep knowledge and insight into the love. Um, I think that the, the prison for, for me and for a lot of people right now is a prison of anxiety. Yes. And, and it's, it feels as, as strong for many as physical chains. And yet there's this dynamic with there's no fear in love, like First John says, perfect love casts out fear. Yeah. How, how is it that we can be kind of living that anxiety that we might not even know we're anxious, but like, uh, you know, a, an eye tick will show up or we'll suddenly get a headache or, you know, we might not, we might feel like we're dealing with it perfectly, yeah. but we've just, just watched a little too much news. And so it's having an effect on us. How can this insight into love 
help us manage and live in that like tension where it doesn't just consume us all the time. So, so how could that insight into love help us manage our anxieties and fears? Well, one thing I think is to accept it. I mean, to, to just say, it's, it's okay. And then use the word and. I feel anxious and. Mm, not but or, right. or not. Like it doesn't yeah. own me, but then also go bigger than that. Like you were saying about nature, that um, you're, you're small compared to what's going on in, in God and so on. So, but to, to just welcome it. I mean, we can't. We can't shoo it away. It's there. Well, I mean, some people, like, I was at Home Depot trying to keep my distance yesterday, six feet or more, and this guy was, like, right up on me. And I was, like, trying, you know, I was backing up pretty quick. But it was like he was in denial that there was the need for it. So, I mean, there is, there is some people are not accepting it. No, I mean, accept, like, I need to accept my own feelings of fear. Oh, I see what you're saying. My own feelings of anxiety. Okay. To, to to just welcome them in, make friends with them, say, come on in, let's just talk here. Oh, wow. But then realize that that's not all of who I am. I'm, I'm more than my fear. Mm-hmm. Wow. And to make yeah. sure there's space for God yeah. to be in that space, too. Talk it down, you know, just talk down the fear a little bit. Okay, I see you fear. Let's have a talk. Let's have, you know. And maybe one of Paul's strategies on getting to love and not letting love and not letting anxiety or being imprisoned take him so much is that, that gratitude thing that Stephanie had mentioned at the beginning mm-hmm. and you were talking about. Like there's a practice, that practice itself kind of resets yeah. the conversation you have with your own anxiety. And you know what, and what you were talking about just now reminded me of the story of Jesus when he was sleeping in the boat. Yeah. And the disciples are in the boat. Like Jesus is in the boat with them, yet they are so afraid. And so it's almost like, you know, yes, we can be afraid. We can have fear. We can own that fear and say, okay, <laughs> I have that. But yet Jesus is in the boat with me. You know, like, and what does Jesus have to say to my fear? Mm. Mm. So, yeah, what's the, what's the calming word? Because we know our brains have a lot of uncalming yeah. thoughts, right? Yeah. And um, I think I said this to the staff. We, were, <laughs> we, we bought a little fire pit, and so we've been burning sticks and we're sitting around and roasting marshmallows. And we had the whole family around, and, and there was a palpable sense of anxiety because we just heard some new closing. I mean, there was just yeah. some new big, you know, we're hearing these big things every day. It seems. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it was like, we couldn't just get ourselves out of that with a fire and some marshmallows. It was, it was palpable among myself, but the kids too. Yeah. And so we like reconvened 30 minutes later and we did some worship and I just asked, so I know we're all scared, What's a calming word from Jesus that you might offer for the group? And um, I might be harder with a 10-year-old, you know, because yeah. they're adult, they're almost adults. And, Still, you know. Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> not. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe the 10-year-old would have some insights that we, I need to play yeah. more. Yeah. Maybe he'll say, yeah. the word is, I need to play more. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the words that came were really powerful. Be still and know. I was like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we have to be still right now. We have to. You know? Um, so, I mean, the, the, we have to recognize that anxiety is real. Yeah. And it's a, it's a natural reaction to danger. Yeah. Um, and it sometimes goes beyond that to fight or flight when it's not appropriate. Um, but, but there's also ways where we can manage it in grace. Yeah. Yeah, that anxiety um, also reminds me of when, you know, after Jesus is crucified and the disciples go to the upper room and they lock themselves in there. Yeah, they lock themselves. Right? Because right. they're so anxious and they're so nervous and they're, they're consumed by fear. And yet Jesus mm. comes in and says, peace, mm. you know, and, and, and shows them his nail-scarred hands. You know, I've overcome death. 
you know, that, that, is, that is the word. That is the calming word. So I, I think, did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, you could just say that again. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. so but then I, I think there are so many voices that many of us are hearing right now saying, oh, oh don't worry, or oh, yeah. don't be scared, or it's not that big of a deal. But I love that image of Jesus showing his, the nail scars in his hands, saying, you don't have to be afraid because I have overcome death. Yeah. Not because death and hardship and disease and suffering aren't real, but because in the glorious mystery of the incarnation, God entered into all of that with us and came out the other side. And Kyle's sermon did a great job of talking right. about that, and our yeah. gospel reading today yeah. really speaks to that as well. So, so, so just like the disciples, Allison was saying that they locked themselves in a room, which was, I guess, a natural thing to do. Yeah. We wouldn't condemn them for that. We wouldn't look down on them for that. I mean, right. the, their leader right. had just been crucified. Roman right. Empire didn't like him. Yeah. Leaders didn't like him. <laughs> you yeah. know, so he yeah. dies. Yeah. And, and we're not going to, we don't need to, like, shame ourselves about the anxiety we might Absolutely. feel. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. everybody yet, out there, you just got a little taste of my Easter sermon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I showed my cards a little no, bit. No, no, that's sorry. The, the, no, just preach it's, it again. That's powerful. It's percolating. But the so. idea that he would, given the locked door, yeah. would enter through it. Yeah. yeah. That's really powerful. So maybe there's something about the inside of love Paul's talking about. Going through the prison bars or through our anxieties into where we are. Absolutely. Maybe even deeper than where our anxieties are. One of the Im I hope we can show this on Wednesday because one of the images for Lazarus um, is him in the tomb looking out, and you can see Lazarus the light. in the tomb. Or yeah, okay. I'm talking about Lazarus because after he's raised him. from the dead. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, he's in the tomb. This is he's the twelve o'clock service, and on he's Sunday, looking on out from the tomb to the light, like the um, the landscape, and it's just um, you know you don't see that kind of an image yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. from the perspective of right. him being alive and then seeing the life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was thinking maybe that could be a good perspective for me looking out, like in the darkness, but looking out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seeing the light. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And just wanted to remind all of you out there, we're talking about um, a painting that we'll, we will be using at our um, Lenten midweek service, which is Wednesday at noon. So we'll also be streaming that, and it will also be on Sundial. And also the bulletin for that will be on our website. If you go to the resources tab and um, hit bulletins and scroll all the way down, you'll be able to see that bulletin, and you'll be able to see the painting that uh, Wendy is referring to. Well, why don't we go down, why don't we uh, read a little bit more of Philippians 1 here. Um, Steph, I'm going to ask you to read the next, uh, let's see here. Let's do, are we up to verse 12? We are up to verse 12. Let's do 12 to 18 and see how far that takes us for now. All right. Here we are starting at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. Mm -hmm. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that, I rejoice. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's just take that in for a second. There's a lot there. There is a lot there. 
So I guess what I'm thinking is how God can take something that is dark, that is broken, and bring life out of that and light. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that or give some examples from your life or, you know, um, because when he says, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And you have to remember here that Paul had, Paul has been persecuted. I mean, it's not just that Paul has been in prison. Paul has been beaten. Paul has been, I mean, there's, a, there's just a lot of things that have happened to Paul. We probably don't even know the extent to which Paul has suffered um, at, you know, at the hands of people who just, of, of his enemies. And, and those aren't just um, Jewish leaders who don't like his message. Right. Those, are those are church members that he served, right. fellow ministers who have betrayed him. Absolutely. And you see that tension in most of his letters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Corinthian correspondence. And, mm-hmm. But there's just a lot of pain there. Absolutely. A lot of pain of, of man, uh, yeah. the, you know, some people are, are taking this gospel I love so much in there. Yeah. They're manipulating people. Yeah. And I can't, I'm not there to do anything about it. Right, you know? right, right. Uh, but Joseph says, um, you know, you meant harm for me, but God meant it for good, you know, and it's almost like I hear that statement echoing through Paul right here. So do you guys want to speak a little bit about that? That's, um, the, the amazing thing is it's not about him. You know, he's, he's like the important things, whether, whether I have good motives or false, Christ has been preached. Christ has been preached. That's what he's most concerned about, which is him totally transcending his ego. Like, uh, Richard Rohr talks a lot about the ego and how the ego is like your cup that you build. It's like the walls and the foundation and the bottom of your personality, of who you are. And um, that's so important for you to actually have. Yeah. You, you, you need to grow an ego growing up. And that's what we do with sports and all the achievement stuff we do. We, we try to find our place in the world and build an ego. But then he talks about how critically important it is at some point in your journey to actually transcend your ego. Yeah. And I feel like that's what Paul's done here. Like when he was knocked on his bottom off of a horse and blinded for several days, that started the transition. Yeah. yeah. He had everything. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He had all the right schooling. He was, he was passionate for the Jewish uh, uh, perspective to be put forth in the Roman world. I mean, he was a leader, and then the horse, the Damascus Road came and get knocked off the horse, and, and Christ speaks to him, and, and I think that's the beginning, yes. you know, yes. of that transition to a spiritual adulthood. Mm, yeah. You know? I'm really intrigued by verse 13 here, where Paul says that um, what has happened to him has actually helped spread the gospel to the whole imperial guard. Mm. That whatever Paul is enduring or proclaiming through his words and through his actions is somehow actually witnessing to the government officials of the Roman Empire. Right. And what does it mean as Christians who are shaped by an alternative story? to have the way that we are living and talking be something that's held up and that the government even sees, right. sees something radically different, sees the message of Jesus Christ in. Uh, well, there's, I think there's a, there's a lot of folks that would see, you know, um, their Christianity sort of in perfect lockstep with whatever government they're, per, they're personally connected with. Uh, whether you, wherever you are in the world, and there's others that find their faith uh, actually at odds. And it's interesting to me how folks who um, who are connected uh, and and the, like you feel per- like certain people feel persecuted for their faith, but I think sort of the radical way of Jesus is to understand that persecution is part of it. And, and for Paul, he's not making that about his imprisonment. He's about making it about reaching people for Christ, you know. 
I guess this reminded me of the Beatitudes, um, especially the last one, blessed are those that persecute you. Um, and just how much, like you said, how it was bigger than him. He, was, he wasn't thinking about himself. But to be totally free from whether somebody loves me or whether they don't love me, mm. you know, that just doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Wow. And that, to me, is beyond. I can't even imagine that. Wow. But it feels like that's where he is. The, is that the prayer of indifference you've talked a lot about? Yeah, that would be close to the prayer of indifference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to have sort of a space between... Um, you and whatever's going on. Not that it, you're not caring. It doesn't mean that. But you are indifferent to anything but the will of God. And I feel like that's where he is. He's indifferent to anything but the will of God. And that's in a, a way sort of, call. Yeah. In a way sort of not, not blessing the actions or the motivations, but blessing the people that are spreading the gospel for, from hell will. I, I love the... Um, the question, what does it matter? Yeah. Like right now, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. that this is the way we have to do a Bible study. Mm -hmm. What does it matter? We're still doing it. Well, so far. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so okay. far. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of what does it matter, I think, going on right now. What does it matter? And Paul's answer in verse 18 is just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way. Mm -hmm. And then he talks here about people who are um, preaching kind of a different gospel than he is. Um, so kind of some rivals. And I wanted to ask you guys, you know, how do we deal with people who preach a different gospel than we do? You know, I mean, how do we as Christians... Um, in the, Love and embrace those people. In the, tra in the tradition or outside the tradition? I guess both. I mean, just kind of an open-ended question. It's in, I mean, I don't claim to really understand what this passage means at all. But <laughs> it's interesting here that for Paul's explanation here, it seems like they are proclaiming Christ, but out of different motives. Yeah. He says, some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. And I'm really interested to know more about what that might mean or yeah. what was going on in that context. Yeah. That Paul, in, you know, other, in other letters of Paul, he's very yeah. explicitly saying these false teachers are preaching a different gospel. Right. right. But right here it seems to be that they're preaching Christ, but for selfish motives. Right. And, yeah. uh, and I do think, though, that there's enough places where he talks about the Judaizers and those sorts of things. So we, we don't necessarily know these were Judaizers. But certainly, those people were preaching Christ, but with an interpretation that was certainly not for Paul based on the free grace of God. You know, um, I don't know if he would say that same thing, but as to your question, um, what, what we think about other traditions who might be preaching a gospel that is focused on Christ, but which seems to be in some ways different. Right, like maybe, like just an example is maybe the prosperity gospel, you know, right. still, the, you know, preaching, preaching Christ, but with this slant mm -hmm. that God grants you success, God's happy with you, you prosper, yeah. you know, this is like, so how do so we... So I, I, you know, I, I read a book on that and it's kind of dated now, but, but they did a study and how that came about was um, a lot of African-American churches that were dealing with uh, serious economic, you know, basic trauma and systemic problems. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't taught like, if you say these certain things, that you'll get these certain things. But it was really focused on believing yes. that a better day could come. Yes. And so there was really something pastoral mm -hmm. in the development of that teaching mm -hmm. that was very important for the people who were needing it at that, that time. So I think when we look at other traditions who might, we feel like have gone sort of off the road a little bit or have, have feel like they, they've, we can bless the original impulse, mm -hmm. the original understanding of what that's about. For instance, uh, 
many at Fuller Seminary uh, have done some work with uh, different religions, uh, specifically the uh, Latter-day Saints. And there's been a lot of writing around the Latter-day Saints. Why was it that, that, that they developed? And, and a lot of the theory is, is that, well, Presbyterian at the time, Presbyterianism at the time, was so cold and stark that the people needed a sense of transcendence. And so, you know, you see that with the Azusa revival and uh, with the charismatic movement around the world and Pentecostalism. Some of the Pentecostalism for a reformed person that it, it's, some of it is not really focused on grace as much as the experience you're having in church. But I think we have to also understand that being the frozen chosen sometimes ask the question of those that they need a transcendent gospel. They need God to come. And I need to feel God come. Because i got to make it through this next eight hours. You know, so I think that we can critique other people's uh, doctrines, but also understand that God's working in them. Right. Even if we don't fully agree oh, with absolutely. everything about them. And I want to, make sense? I'm sorry. I just want to recommend a book to everybody out there called Holy Envy, which was written by Barbara Brown Taylor, who explores. She's a, she's an Episcopal priest that is now teaching intro to religion <laughs> at a little at a little uh, college called Piedmont, I believe, down in Georgia. She's awesome, and uh, she's written so many. She's very prolific. She's written so many books that are wonderful. But this one in particular is just exploring different religions and what we can learn as Christians um, from these other religions and how they can enrich our own uh, spiritual experience and how we experience God, that these other traditions can actually kind of enrich us. So um, where, yeah, where would Martin Luther King be without Gandhi's understanding of Jesus? Or, or, or nonviolent. Nonviolent resistance. Exactly. I mean, Gandhi, he, King would have not, I mean, Gandhi taught, Gandhi, a Hindu, taught King, a Christian pastor, about the power of nonviolence. Right. Through Jesus. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure how long we go to I don't know. Um, what time is it? Pinto, I think it's. Yeah, we've got a couple more minutes. Okay. Yes. I've got. Can I just say, I see in this section of verses 15 to 18, for us, both maybe a word of caution, but also a word of grace. That I'm thinking now, I don't know if maybe I'm just a church nerd, but I've also been watching like lots of other churches' live streams this week. <laughs> and I know, especially as we're frantically trying to come up with new ways to be the church together, I think for those of us who are church leaders and teachers and probably for our pastors too, there might be a real temptation to rivalry of wanting to know, you know, do we have the coolest online ministry or do we have the most people streaming our service? Um, and I think I, I think I feel that temptation as a session member Absolutely. and as a teacher. And I think Absolutely. that's that's a real easy um, temptation for us to fall into. Yes. So I think this offers us both a word of caution yeah. that we need to be careful that in everything that we're doing, that yeah. it's not because we want our website to be really super cool <laughs> so that we look like the hip church, but so that Christ is proclaimed. Absolutely. But I think there's also here a real word of grace that we are all fallible leaders and we are going to have impure motives and that God uses even that. God uses even our, you know, hopes that people are really liking our live stream and are, you know, look, looking for metrics of how many clicks we get and how many Facebook likes we get that even if our motives aren't always pure, that God is at work and God is the one who is using all of this to make Jesus' name known. Right. And God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion. And Amen. That's, you know, that's, that gives me hope because we are. We're all fallible human beings. I mean, and as church leaders, I resonate with that stuff. Even though I know it's wrong, I'm like, man, I hope this is like, I hope this is, this is cool or this is, you know, or people like this or, you know, that's what I'm thinking. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's grace, right? And just praise the Lord that we have grace. Yeah. And there will be baskets of loaves left over, right? <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> there will be. Well, I mean, we feel that. I mean, I feel that every, every time I preach, and I always yeah. have, is how did I do today? 
How did I do? Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Did I serve well? Did yeah. my sermon resonate? It's it's a constant, yeah. and we live in such a production oriented world. We do. Um, to to live in that indifference that yeah. you were talking about, and that Paul seems to have arrived at that sense of I'm a pencil in the hand of God. Right. Uh, God can write a beautiful poetry poem. Not that we don't have a choice to participate. We do, but that God God is God is in control, and I'm. My, my, my place is to respond to grace, right. um, not to produce the grace, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, man. I'm just reminded, is it Eugene Peterson in his book, Long Obedience in the Right Direction? Long Obedience so in the Right Direction. So let's all try to have a long obedience in the right direction. Oh, that's yeah. great. We've, we've, uh, I just want to do a plug right now. Uh, we've mentioned several fantastic books today. Um, and Hearts and Minds uh, had to close for this time, um, which is a wonderful little bookstore in Dallas Town. It's where we... Award-winning bookstore. Award-winning. We get all our books there. And, um, you know, if you're interested in any of these books, you can contact Byron Borger. And um, still doing... Um, yep, just to you? clarify, we are closed to in-store shopping. In-store shopping. But you can absolutely give us a call or go to the website, and we can either deliver things or send things through the mail. And you can just email the church, too. Absolutely. You can just email the church we'll as well. We'll send it on to them. Um, how many more minutes do we have here, guys? Do we want to get through one, or do we want to hold here and then pick up... We're, there's some great think? stuff in the next section. There is some really and great do. stuff. I don't want to rush through that. It's 1020 right now. It's 1020? Yeah. Okay, what do we usually go to? Like 1020? 1020. 1020 or 1030, we can. <laughs> okay, okay. Normally, I know we try to leave time for people to mill about and have coffee, but yeah, that's exactly. not happening that's today. Not happening today. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody's drinking their coffee as yes. they're kind of yes. listening to us. But yeah, the, if you stuff. have not worshipped yet, the second service is at 1045. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would be really great is if somehow we could take questions from you guys. So I think... We've been kind of batting that around this week is how can we get your questions kind of like a feed kind of going? For folks who are watching on the Facebook live stream, if you have yeah. a Facebook account, you can write comments in the chat there. Okay. That might be one option to look into. Okay. Um, that means that maybe next week we'll have to have our phones with us so that we're actually looking, you know, and looking at that feed because right now... Christian Hunter is back there, and he's got the feed going right back there. We, we, we don't have access to those questions. But next week, what we'll do is we'll bring our cell phones in so that we can maybe take some questions from you guys, because um, it'll be a little bit more of a, you know, interactive experience for you. So. Should, we, should we end with prayer? Before we do that, can we just take a moment to remind people of a couple of the other opportunities that sure. we have to dig into the Word? Um, on Wednesday, of course, as Allison and Wendy mentioned, we have our noon Lenten service that's also available on the video stream and through the sundial call-in. And then Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30, we're going to be having a Bible study series that you can also access either on this same video stream or through the uh, phone system. That's Wednesdays from 7 to 8.30. And then we also have an ongoing Facebook Bible study group where folks have an opportunity to chat on your own schedule about our uh, gospel passages that we're hearing read and proclaimed in worship each week. And you can get to that by going to facebook.com slash groups slash FPC online Bible study. Facebook.com slash groups slash FPC online Bible study. And each week we're putting up a post with the week's gospel lesson and some questions for reflection. And throughout the week you can comment and discuss there. Great. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. And we're just going to continue to stream on Sunday mornings just like this. We're going to continue having this Bible study in between our two services. So we hope that you tune in. And um, in this way, we're just hoping that we stay connected to you. And 
you know, it's so hard for you, I know, to, to feel our love to you, but we want to just uh, feel like... Longing, as Paul says. <laughs> the longing is coming, is coming through the, the camera right now and, and, and also just the telephone because we sure miss, we miss seeing you, but how great is it going to be um, on Sunday when we can come back together? And as I said in my prayer today, just a deeper appreciation, I think, for the things that we have taken for granted. So it's going to be an amazing day to get, gather back together. In the meantime, this is what we have to do, so we make the best of it. And I'm so thankful to Wendy Smith for being here today in her Lenten purple. She's in her Lenten purple sweater, as is so Steph over Steph. here. So I should have worn my purple blazer, so sorry about that. I'm going to get with the program next week. Um, do you have a purple tie on? No, you I don't. don't. We have the purple robe, though. We have the purple, yeah, we do have the purple, the purple stoles, so. But anyway, I, I think, I do think it's appropriate to end with prayer. Uh, do you want me to do that, or do you want? Sure. Okay. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are good, you are awesome, you are mighty, you are sovereign. Lord, I thank you so much for this time of Bible study, of diving into the word, of good fellowship, and I thank you so much for the people that I'm sharing the stage with today, Lord. And I want to thank you for all the people who have tuned in today. I want to pray, Lord, that you bless their lives, be with us through this time of isolation and uncertainty. Lord, help us to still proclaim your name. That during this time, Christ would be preached, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the ways in which we can connect. I think technology has, uh, we often um, see the negatives and all the, all the social media and everything like that. But I think this is one time when we can actually see the positives of just being able to stay connected online and over the internet. And so... Um, we give you thanks for that. Um, of course, we just want to pray for all the people who are affected um, by this pandemic. We know that even as we join today and have this Bible study, that people are fighting for their lives, Lord. And so we don't want to forget them, Lord, because this is a serious virus and um, it's, it's wreaking havoc in our communities. And so we just want to pray for all those who are struggling and um, suffering. With this, with this illness. We just pray for them. We pray for peace. We pray for comfort. We pray for healing, Lord. And I thank you so much that we are connected through this body of Christ. It is an honor. It's a privilege to proclaim your word. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you be with us until we meet again in person or virtually. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Hi, everybody.